Man, if you come to a Bowling for Soup show to hear the songs, you've come to the wrong day. <laughs> like how like into streaming and instagram and tiktok like like you're just like you're like i'm not gonna fucking get left behind here fuck that like, I'm, I'm diving into this shit <laughs> it's so true man it's uh it's a whole thing though right it's like uh just trying to keep up man it's like you know but i mean that's that's part of the whole whole deal now it's you know yeah I mean, I really enjoy it, actually, you know, I mean, I, especially TikTok. I mean, I have fun doing that. I, I hate the fact that if I don't do it for a while, you know, I, I feel like they kind of punish you <clears throat> and, mm. you know, it takes a while to, to get back to where they're actually showing your videos to people. But I don't yeah. know. Do we really even know if that's the thing? We all just guess, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, whatever the gurus say that week, right, about mm -hmm. <laughs> engagement and whatnot. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's just cool. It's cool because I feel like it gives you a chance to kind of like get to know your audience and your and like your fans and stuff a little on a whole nother level as opposed to like them just listening to music and seeing it at shows. You're actually like yeah. a lot of times talking to them direct, which is pretty cool. For sure, man. Yeah, I mean it's not unlike the MySpaces and the Facebooks and the you know just kind of a little bit mm -hmm. more, um, you know, just a little bit. <laughs> A little bit more access as we get, you know, each year we're just giving more and more access to ourselves. Yeah, yeah, because you guys were around before MySpace, obviously. Like, did you yeah. see like a big pop when MySpace became like the big thing? I mean, sort of. I mean, I, I what we saw really was the bands that broke out of MySpace. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously Fall Out Boy and um, what was that? Midland. Um, is that their, was that their name? Mid Midland? Midtown. I, Midtown. Yeah, yeah like that, that like broke out of that whole thing, and in fact, it, oh, we were in uh, we were in Atlanta recording with Butch Walker, and uh, his the his studio manager Christy was like, "Have y'all seen this MySpace thing? The Midtown <laughs> guys were just here, and they're all over this. You got to check it out. It's really cool." And like by the time we left, we were all just completely hooked. But oh yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny. It's like when we when we started in '94. We were still, you know, no cell phones, making albums on cassette. Um, you know, I mean, it was, it was a, a different world, that's for sure. We've, we've sort of, you know, just it seems like every two or three years, it's just a completely different thing. You know, that, oh yeah, I think, you gotta relearn the new, the new hype. One hundred percent. Yeah, it's uh, that's part of it, though. You know, I mean, I think that that that's sort of where I think bands. You know, you, you choose. You got it. You choose to. You choose to keep up, or you choose to get left behind. You know, and it's it's. You know, unfortunately, it's it's way less about just making good music than it ever has been. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have to be able to sell it yourself and and be a good people person and and all of that. Which you know, I don't. I don't necessarily think is a bad thing. You know, I. Yeah. I you know, I guess you're. That's your product these days, right? Well, a lot of bands, I see them complain a lot about like. I don't want to be a content creator. I don't want to make videos. I don't want to market. Like, I just want to make the music and play the shows. And it's like, you know, in the eighties and the nineties, like bands had to, you know, camp outside of record label, like offices and just hope to find a guy with a tie walking by them and hand them a demo and hope to pray to God they would listen to it. And now yeah. it's like, you could reach those same executives by posting a 30 second clip on TikTok and yeah. go viral. And they come after you, you know, it's like, it, I mean, don't get yeah. me wrong, making content's not easy. It is time consuming. It's a pain in the ass, yeah. you know, and it's yeah. frustrating when you post something you're excited about and flops. But also the the barrier of entry has never been lower, <laughs> you know? Yeah, you know, you're 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 dead on. I mean, it, it's you you see you know, it's funny, it's like the everybody complains about it at every stage, you know. It's mm -hmm. like it, it bands wanna be like, Man, I want it to be I just wanna make music and tour and play shows and you know and then and the and you know in the 80s as you said they had their own set of problems you know and yeah and, you know being a being a band that was in a van from 94 to 2003 you know i can tell you that just making music and touring was a lot of fun but it didn't really do us a whole lot of good you know i mean we, mm -hmm. we you know it was you can reach so much more people from your house now so I don't really necessarily, I, I feel, 
It's it's interesting. I feel I feel bad that that today's bands won't really ever get to experience that, like literally driving into t- a town and just figuring out a, right. a, a, a like finding a show. You know, just I mean, literally just road dogging it the way that we did because that that was my thing was. If we didn't have a show, we were in a city. I would go to any a bar that I knew had bands, and I'd be like, "Do you have a band tonight?" No. Do you want one? We'll play for fifty bucks and four hamburgers and a case of beer. <laughs> you know, and yeah, and we got so many gigs that way, and made so many longtime friends. And those are those are the stories that we tell. And obviously, I'm telling it now, but at the same time, man, it's like bands are like, you know, I just want to tour, and I'm like, yeah, well, you you know, touring now is sitting and building your social media. You know, right. It's, building building that content it's just what it is you know i mean but if you'd have told a 90s kid that like hey man you don't have to get out there and you don't have to sleep at truck stops and go a week without a shower and and you know just eat you know tortillas from taco cabana for three days and Mm -hmm. you you don't have to do that you can sit at home and just like (laughs) promote your music on the computer that they would probably trade you you know oh yeah yeah, like how many knows. artists now like will have viral songs on like the top of the charts and have not even played a show yet? Like they haven't even toured yeah. or done anything yeah. yet outside. Man, of look at the look at the Al City guy. He didn't even have a mm-hmm. band. You know, yeah. I mean that that song was like the biggest song ever. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean it's there. That kind of stuff happens. I mean, it, and then that that band uh, that's huge on TikTok now. The the guy's super cool, Loveless. Loveless, yeah. You know, I was just gonna blew up blew up during COVID, mm-hmm. and. And you know that now that guy sells out everywhere he goes. So it just goes to show you that the that that grind does work. It you know the system is in place and it's and here we are. You know. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I just saw Loveless uh, a few weeks ago. They were in Cleve. I've, yeah, I've known him since. Uh, well, that whole those, those two guys since their first song even came out. And I remember like when they started blowing up. Um, I was talking about shows and stuff. He's like, Yeah, I still gotta get a band together. We haven't had. We haven't found a drummer to play a show yet and like th- that was when they had like a viral song <laughs> on tiktok yeah. it's yeah, yeah it's unreal so do you think yeah, that model crazy. of just like everyone piling in a van and, and just hoping for the best is kind of not worth it anymore here's here's the reason why um people don't go see music for discovery anymore like right. the reason we would all go out and tour and go from city to city and trade shows with bands is because in all in all major cities, even you know, and uh, cities of any size, really, you know, hundred thousand and above, you had a place that there'd be four or five bands playing, and you'd just be like, "Hey, man, you want to go see some bands tonight?" It didn't even matter mm-hmm. who you were going to see, and that does not exist anymore. It's it's it literally doesn't. It's not a thing. Mm-hmm. Um. So you know you, th- which is why, you know, and I I do. I do understand why ba- why younger bands get butt hurt when when people are trying to get them to sell tickets to their shows or you know they're they're asking about their draw before they come in. It's like you know we got to get people in the building. You know, it's, yeah. it's not just a given that you go play Trees on a Friday night and the place right. is going to be full. Like it matters who's playing, and it didn't. You know, back in the day, you know, it was uh, you know you you would show up and. You know, sometimes there'd be 20 people and sometimes there'd be 200 people seeing some band that they were in youth group with at church and you sold five shirts and that got you to the next city, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's unfortunate, but, I, but you know, I also think that like, and, I, and I'm really talking really, really grassroots. You know, I think if you've got, if you've got something going on, you can, you can get out there in the van and, and go do it. You know, it's, it's, uh. But, you know, it's, I think it's just different. You know, I think it's just that the, the, uh, the, the social media aspect of things is just so much more important than that, you know, and that's, that's what, you know, here's an example. It'd be like, uh, you know, you, you talk into a label in the late nineties, they'd be like, okay, what's your draw in such and such cities? How many people can you bring here and here and here? And now they don't give a shit about that. They're, they're right. like, you know, what are your streaming numbers? You know, how many people are on your email list? You know, what, what, how, what are your TikToks like? You know, that kind of thing. And, you know, whether it's good or bad, it just, it's the way that it is as far as I'm, that's as far as the way I see it. I agree. And like, I have bands ask me all the time, like about getting on record labels, like how can they get a sign and whatnot. And like, First of all, I'm always asking, well, what do you want out of a label? Like, what are you expecting yeah. a label to do for you, first of all? And then yeah. second of all, yeah. like, my biggest advice is right now you have the opportunity and you should be making the most hype you can and have them come to you. Like, 
I feel like yeah. any label you go after this day and age is not a label. That, any label that you go after and then signs you is probably not a label that really is going to do much for you because they're pretty much taking whatever they can get at that point. You know, it's almost yeah. like it's just it's just a name to put on the back of your record, which you probably don't even have a record because you don't have any physical CDs anymore. <laughs> but yeah. you know, I mean, yeah, you know, you you're right in that. Like, so the way that I always say to people is like, you know, when do we? How do we get a booking agent? Well, first mm -hmm. of all, you shouldn't get a booking agent until you need a booking agent. You know, like, how do we get a lawyer? We sh well, you shouldn't get a lawyer until you need a lawyer. Yeah. You know, how do we get signed to a label? Well, you shouldn't get signed to a label until you need a label. And mm -hmm. chances are these days, if you work your way through all of that, you can do all of this without some or all of those things. You know, right. like it, you know, you've got people like, you know, uh, Jake and Connor Price and people like that that were just like, you know what, fuck it, I'm just not going to sign to a label, and and you know, and then they're they're all just signed to the same distributors that all of all of the other independent artists are, right? You know, and and they're out there absolutely killing it, and they're keeping all the money. You know, really, you know what what labels are good for are the people who, I think that they still have a definite place in this industry. It's for those sure. people who need that that help with you know like they're not that strong on social media or they don't you know it, because the, really what what they bring to the table more than anything is money you know it's it's like hey can we get five thousand dollars to go make this video can we get this can we get that you know um but quite frankly you know if if your goal is just to sign with a label you're you need to step back and rethink that because as you said you're likely going to just sign and give up a big percentage of nothing Mm -hmm. to somebody that's not going to do anything for you. And then you're just going to be, you know, you're, you're going to be very, very frustrated. That's pretty much how a lot of people end up quitting the music business. You know? Yeah. A lot of people burn out that way. Like I yeah. almost like envision it more like, you know, cause your band is a business and like any yeah. other business, you know, you have to expand your team when the time is right. You know, you get, you know, you get a manager when things are, when you can't manage it anymore, when it's unmanageable, yeah. it's like, and I feel like any, you know, booking agent, manager, lawyer, label, it's all kind of an expansion of your team. Yeah. And it really shouldn't be something you consider until, like, you can't do it yourself, you know, anymore. Because it's so big. You know what? You know what? You just, you just put it. That's, and that's exactly what I say. But you just put it into my head, like, now I know how to explain it to people with, with, and I can give you an example of, mm -hmm. of how this could work. Watch Shark Tank. There you go. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. if you can't go in there and sell that thing with like proven this, proven that, proven that, or an idea that they just don't care about that. If you have the material where that they just don't give a shit how big you are, they're like, fuck it, we're doing this. That's yeah. very, very low percentage. Right. You know, if you go in there and you have two million in sales last year, they all they all go, whoa, okay, now we're right. listening. And that's the thing, right? What is the product that you have and, and what are you developing and, and where are you at on it? And that's just the thing is what I try to explain again is, you know, getting an agent like you're you're instantly giving up 10 percent of what you're making out there. And quite frankly, you're still going to be doing most of the hustle. You're going to be sending yeah. them in. I'll go, you have the glory of having this booking agent that you're going to go, hey, this dude emailed and wants us to play this show this weekend, uh, so I'm going to send him your email. And you literally just did all – oh, and they're going to pay us $200, and they're not going to take a merch percentage, and they said that we could have uh, 12 beers. And, and so go talk to this guy. And you just did right. all the work. You already negotiated you know? it. You already – yeah. You're just you sending sent an email. You know? Yeah. And it's like I think I think people – I think I think there's an illusion that when you get let's just talk booking agent. I mm -hmm. think there's an illusion that if you just if you get a booking agent, all of a sudden you're going to be on tour with Blink One Eighty Two. Right. And that is not how it works. It is not how it works. Yeah, no. Everyone thinks like that's the key to getting a big tour. It's like oh, you get a booking yeah. agent, and then they, they do all the way. It's like the booking agent has more contacts, but they yes. have the same struggle that mm -hmm. you do trying to get a band that no one cares about on a tour with bands that people do care about. Like what's right. the draw there? Why would they put you on? Right. What's the draw? Why would they put you on? Does, does the headliner like what you're doing? Do they like yeah. your fans? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, 
you know, I mean, that's, that's a big thing, right? It's, it's, uh, you know, for me, like personally Bowling for Soup, I don't really care what kind of music you play. It's really, I mean, when we're, when we're taking out a support band, I, I don't I, really like the genre of what you're doing matters not to me. It's like what kind of show you're putting on, you know, like it's yeah. my, my goal is for everybody to leave uh, a Bowling for Soup show with their face hurting from smiling, like literally yeah. like sore the next day, your jaw sore. So, you know, when we go out and we tour with Cliff Diver and at, like last year with Cliff Diver and Less Than Jake and Bowling for Soup, like that, that everybody left, like, ah, my yeah. face hurts, you know? And that, I've been doing that for 30 years, you know? And yeah. uh, so, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, I, you know, it, it sucks because it sounds like we're really taught, we're being kind of downerish. Like and <laughs> now we sound like curmudgeons. <laughs> but really, I feel like it, we're being more uplifting. It's like, yeah, man, you can do this on your own. You don't need that. You know, you don't. It's a, you really, it's really a beautiful don't. time. Like, God damn it. You know, I'm going to I'm going to tell you this and this is going to make you sick. <laughs> we used to spend fifty, seventy five thousand dollars on videos. Like <sighs> Jesus. Uh, high School Never Ends cost seventy five thousand dollars. My and that God. was like, well, that it's a was great us, video. Like, it was a great <laughs> video, but think of like what you can do just with your iPhone now. Like, why yeah. you could film that exact video right now for fifteen hundred bucks, mm -hmm. and that's if you you can't get somebody to donate the location and stuff. Just with your right. friends and shit, you're just out there doing. And I mean, everybody's high school will let them go back in and film stuff. You know, I mean, it's yeah. like. So I just think about that all the time of like just all of that money. And of course we had a label at the time we got dropped. So we were on Jive from uh, 2000 to 2009. So any of the stuff that you see during the heyday, those were pretty big budget. And then we got dropped in 2009 and you see the, uh, our first video back was, uh, I think this is a Saturday, but the first like good video we made was turbulence, which was this ballad. And I rented an airplane. And we still made that video for three grand, you know, and that was in 2010, you know. Do you so, think they just like inflated a lot of the cost too, though, just to so they can charge back to you guys? Like, do they like, oh, we got to pay the sandwich guy, you know, two grand today to bring the sandwiches? Right. Well, yeah, that. And also, you know, to be fair, when you're filming in LA, you have to get, you have to pull permits and do all this. Mm. And, like, everybody has to have like, you know, your grip has to have an assistant and this guy has to have this. So the costs do get up really quick, but there's no question, you know, like we yeah. didn't need, we didn't need that. kind. I mean, in fact, we would never even eat the, the stuff that they would bring because we're like, we were literally in this high school. They set us up a tent so that we could drink beers in there and nobody could see us because high yeah. school was going on. And so <laughs> we're literally just, this is such, this is so bowling for soup and such our life. It's just like anywhere you go to be just like us for, and whoever's with us just being ourselves. And right. like, we're always together. So like, if we're interacting with you, it's all of us. We just, yeah. we're like a little, a little, a little kid's soccer team. You know, we just move around <laughs> And, you know, yes, yeah, I swear we, we had a, like a tent, but like a tent with flaps. You couldn't see yeah. us. And we're in there just in chairs, just drinking beers all day, hearing the bell ring. And, you know, I'm, I am shit faced. By the time we're doing the live thing, if you go back and look at High School Never Ends, um, where I'm in the tux and I'm throwing the guitar and stuff, like I am a mess. I'm like red, <laughs> just drunk because we have been drinking all day, you know. And, and uh, same is true with, um, with 1985, by the time we're Motley Crue, we are all shit faced. But we're we were a few years younger, <laughs> and uh, and uh, we we're a few years younger and a, and a, in a little bit better shape, I think. Then, <laughs> so I don't think it showed quite as much. But um, yeah, man. But yeah, do just, you like even remember the end of that video, or is it just like a drunken blur at that point? No, I remember. I remember it very well. I I I do not remember much of the end of High School Never Ends, if I'm being totally honest. But uh, 1985, I remember. I remember everything about that day. That was just a yeah. really magical day. And, and, uh, you know, we, we, I mean, it was just crazy to me because our, our wardrobe girl had literally just nailed the Motley Crue outfits and like mine, oh, yeah. I mean, it literally looked like Vince Neil's outfit. I don't know how she mm -hmm. did it. And, and, uh, like, I mean, you, we just felt cool, you know, like it was just one of those things yeah. that we, we rented a neighborhood, you know, we had four houses to be able to do that because we had to have the house, 
with the garage. We had to, which which is where they where she's mowing the lawn at the at mm-hmm. the first or whatever. And then we have the house that we're at, but then they had to have another house to where like they had all the crew going in and out of, and then another house for something oh, for staging. I guess they because it was so hot, they had to have all those garages to be able to stage. You know the next. Uh. Thing. So we're not in the same garage every time. So yeah. like uh, it, we're actually in three different garages, and then so we had the three different garages in her house. So oh um, no shit, yeah, I thought it was all yeah. the. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's all done in separate movie magic, different, man. Different house, right? Yeah, yeah. You yeah. can sort of tell in the. Uh, well, now I'm Robert definitely gonna look Potter. for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can you can sort of tell. I read a comment on that video recently. It was like, it's been 19 years since that song's release, which is like the exact amount of time it was when the song was out from 1985. So now people yeah. in their 30s can super. Like really, and like even like yeah. now when I listen to that song, like a lot of those, I mean, a lot of those references are obviously meant for my parents' generation. But it was like yeah. a lot of the, the things you're saying, I'm like, oh shit, like that's yeah. real. That feel, <laughs> you know, that really. Yeah. And I, I think that's pretty cool about that song too. Is it, it like it'll hit a new generation every you know, fifteen twenty years. And you know, there's a lot of remakes too of it. Of it obviously oh, as well, man. a lot of updates. Yeah, we're involved in a lot of them too. Uh, mm-hmm. There's. Um, you know, there's the 2002 version that's out there right now that's just so good. And, uh, you know, there, there was uh, 1999, I think, was uh, Sages. And uh, anyway, there, there's maybe it was 2005. I don't know. There's so many good 2005 ones. 2005 was the one with that, like, that goth kid with the dark hair yeah, with a super stage. deep voice. Yeah, yeah he was cool. Yeah. I liked his a lot. Yeah, he got – he um, actually I'm in touch with that kid. We were going to do a version together, and uh, he actually just sort of, like, couldn't handle the – He's got he's got some mental stuff and he he just mm. it was just too much for him and I, I totally yeah I haven't understand. heard much from him since that song dropped because I remember that dropped and it got huge it was everywhere he's, on TikTok he's uh, he's making music for himself though now and uh, so oh, that's I, good. he's got an album I actually just heard some of it and it's really really good so he's got, uh, he's got yeah, such yeah. a unique voice <laughs> it's so crazy because everybody thought he was faking that talking yeah. voice and things so high it's just so crazy you know yeah. but. But you know, it it, it works. It's, his voice is crazy good. So that song, uh, 1985, was uh, okay. It was originally written by SR71, right? Or at least the shell of it. And then yeah. you guys changed it up. Like, how much of it is that we hear now is the yeah. original version? How much like did you add to it? Okay, so um, yeah, so essentially they had released it in Japan, mm-hmm. and then they broke up. There was no digital. You know, there was no reason that it would ever come out here. So he was shopping the song. Uh, but he, at the same time, Mitch from SR71 was shopping for managers. He was shopping for labels, just trying to figure out what his next move was. Yeah. And Butch Walker's manager, uh, Jonathan Daniel, heard it. We had just finished making A Hangover You Don't Deserve. First single was going to be almost, we were done. Um, which, you know, was a hit. So, you know, I yeah. mean, we were, I yeah, think went we, were, wrong. We, were, we were in good shape, right? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Jonathan Daniel heard it. He goes, man, that doesn't sound like an SR-71. That sounds like a Bowling for Soup song. And so I heard it, and I was just like, man, I don't know. It's pre- it's pretty abrasive. There's like the line, like, never knew George was gay. And there's uh, – because mm-hmm. cause SR-71 was really in your face. Like, they, yeah. they're like – but not funny. Like, they weren't trying to be funny. They were real – you right. know. Uh, this is so crazy that we're talking about this right now because today while we're recording this is the 20th birthday of 1985. Today. No shit. Yeah. Oh man. And so I'm actually going to be releasing a TikTok here in a little bit with me and Mitch and John, the two guys that wrote the song. But uh, yeah. So anyway, um, it we gave it another listen that night, and Gary was like, "Man, it's pretty good." And uh, I don't know, man. I think you know if they're telling us they the label likes it or whatever. So I was just like, "Listen, I just want to be able to change the wor- the lyrics and make it more my what what." what what not i was so mean <laughs> uh, yeah, not, yeah totally and just more subtle you know like yeah, yeah i say get a hand on a member of duran duran and i i mean you know obviously their penis but like it doesn't come across <laughs> you know what i mean it's yeah. like that's a hit little hidden gem yeah. um and then of course but so so lyrically um i made some changes the the bridge is different and uh, the intro is different with it, but but you know we consider it a, a collaboration, a co-write because yeah. my version is is different from theirs. But it, you know it's funny, it, it, people 
and 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 it, this doesn't bug me in any way. It's just weird. Like people sort of like use that to sort of like hold it against the song. Like, oh, oh but like that's a Mr. Seventy One song or whatever. Uh, you know, and it's like okay. I mean, I never hid behind that. Mitch is in the video. Mm-hmm, <laughs> you know, yeah. He, Mitch Allen walks across the thing and like looks at us and goes like this in 1985. Like it was never a secret. I told Mm -hmm. every interview I did. And so when people discover it, they're just like, Oh, their biggest hits a cover. And it's like, ah, you know, I mean, I don't know. It's not really cover. Look, there's a, there's a double platinum plaque right there. And and that same, and a gold plaque and another gold plaque. And those, those three plaques all, Oh, and then an international one. All of those plaques hang in Mitch's studio and in John's studio. And guess what they say on them? Bowling, Bowling for soup. soup. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, well, you know, like, I, I don't know, but it's, it's, uh, pe- first, I don't, I don't really, and I guess it's just sort of like this whole, um, I know this, I know mm-hmm. this about this kind of thing. And it, it's just, it, it's weird. Again, it doesn't bug me. It just is. Uh, it, it's. I don't really know why people want to use that to try and bring us down because it's not a yeah non issue. <laughs> I think it's another one of those social media things where it's like nobody really cared until everyone had a voice to talk about it, and now it's like yeah. it, it's almost it's just content for people now to say like, yeah. oh, did you know? And it's like. Yeah. And then, like, yeah, the problem is, like, people make that video, like, did you know it's actually a cover? And then, like, somebody who hates Bowling for Soup for whatever reason is like, I knew it. I knew they didn't have any fucking good songs. Or, you know, like. I know. know. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple of people that have have done that. Like, did you know most of Bowling for Soup's hits are covers? And it's like, no. (laughs) None of that. First of all. First of all, the Stacy's mom thing is reactionary. Like, uh, we did that as a joke, like because everybody thought it was our song. Yeah. And so, like, and but uh, but yeah, I don't know. I've I've got pretty thick skin in that in that whole thing. But it really, I understand what they're doing too. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's there's this one kid that got under my skin one day, uh, reviewing one of our <laughs> records or whatever, and and I, I I said something back, and then he said something back, and I made a video, and then he made a video back, and I oh, realized. Man. This is what this guy wants. I'm getting him followers. Yeah. I, I give him clout. Like, what am I doing by responding? And so, you know, that's the thing is you, you as an artist, when people are talking about your babies like that, you know, mm. or, or just, you know, man, this band means the world to me. It's my whole life. I've been in this band half. I've been, I'm 51. I've been in this band 30 years, you know, like it's my entire existence. And, you know, I, I, uh, it, it just, you want to be able to defend it, but it's the wrong thing to do. You know, you just, you're just giving them a louder voice, you know? It's so Um, hard not to, like you said though, because like, it's, it's hard not to take it personally when it is your art. It's something you created, you love. It's like, it's not like somebody's like making fun of your hair or something like that. They're making fun of like the (laughs) the fucking thing that you like, you've spent all this time cultivating and creating. And like, I get pulled, like I, I try never to engage, (laughs) you know, in comments. But yeah. what, for whatever reason, I'll open up Instagram or something, and it, it'll be a comment that just, like, as soon as I open up, it's the first thing I read. I'm like, oh, fuck you. And I hit him yeah. back with a good quip. I'm like, ha-ha, gotcha. But that yeah. doesn't end there, of course. Then I spend the next 10 to 15 minutes going back and forth. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm waiting. I, I, I got my, I got to take my kid to school. Why am I fucking? I'm, I've literally been like, trying to get my kid's shoes on. I'm like, fuck you, asshole. <laughs> yeah. 100%. yeah. And you're like, and you find yourself like, okay, that's it. I don't care anymore. But you go yeah. back to see if they responded again. And it's just some fucking 15 year old kid, just a little shitty basement. With a picture of a car for his profile picture. Like, 100%. Just, ah. Yeah. Just, ah, fuck. But they got to you, you know? And yeah. It's just, and that's what they want. They I, wanted to ruin watch, your day. Man, I because I follow you on everything very closely, and I, I love your content. And oh, I, thanks, uh, dude. I see, I see sometimes people trolling you, trying to get you to co- comment on something. And oh really, yeah. You're just, you're reporting on something, and you usually have a you know, and and, there, and really, I, I again, I like it because you bring certain things to light and and uh, and all of that. But man, I, it it's just so hard sometimes. You know, like it, I, so my my little brother sent me this link the other day. And it was this an article that was written earlier this year, and it's called it's called Five Reasons to Hate Bowling for Soup. <laughs> so first of all, <laughs> off to a good start. <laughs> but and most of them are like sort of okay, that's silly or quirky, or whatever. Yeah. One of number five is that the song I'm Gay, uh, which is one of our songs, 
mm-hmm. was stolen from Goldfinger, and that Goldfinger sued us for the song, and that uh, they won, so we didn't put it on our album. First of all, none of that is even remotely true. God, we Goldfinger at our our boys, like they, yeah, like that 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 has never even been a conversation. Second of all, not only is it on the album, yeah. it was a fucking single. <laughs> It was a genuine hit in the UK. Like they had, they're just disregarding all the facts of this thing. Like it's, it's the most bonkers, like just made up thing. And I, I literally like, I was like, son of a bitch. I know I'm supposed <laughs> to just let this stuff go, but that's just a blatant lie that yeah. this person they literally made that up. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, I hit my manager and I'm like, I don't give a shit what it costs. Like I want that motherfucker to apologize to me and yeah. take this time. Whatever. Did and you get I, any response I, from him? No, I have since. Ah, he he fucking. knows how to deal with me. I just I was drinking beers and I was fine the next day. Just going, oh, I'm gonna go find that here. article and blast that guy. Fuck him. Yeah, <laughs> fucking do it, man. I, I wish do everybody it. that's everybody who's watching this that that has any sort of affection towards me. Yeah, go find that fucking thing and just give that guy shit, man. Because, Discredit uh, the shit out of it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to give him any more. Pr- I shouldn't even have said the name of the article, but it's out there now and fuck it. But, uh, fuck him. Yeah. Dude, that's so ridiculous. Yeah, I I remember you shared a uh, a review. It was like a review of another band. And the, in the review, it was like it was a band, I guess, that made like uh, like funny songs. And, the, and in the review, it's like the band is uh, dangerously close to getting bowling for soup disease or something where their songs yeah, are too yeah. sick. And I was like, yeah, it was like yeah. such a weird way just like to shit on bowling for soup or no, <laughs> and another band's well, review. Actually, what was funny about that article is what you it was steel Panther actually. Is oh, that's was. what it was. Yeah. Yeah. And so essentially what they were saying is, is that steel Panther who does talk during their show was, yeah was starting to teeter towards the side of talking as much as we do during our show. And I was like, is that supposed to hurt my feelings? People yeah. know what they're playing to come see, you know? Like, right. I don't give a shit. You know, if, if, if you, I, I say this all the time, you know, there's always some drunk guy that's like, play a song. And I'm like, man, if you come to a Bowling for Soup show to hear the songs, you've come to the wrong band. <laughs> you know, like that is not why you come see a Bowling for right, Soup show. Right. Yes, we're going to play the songs. And yeah, we're going to play them well, and it's going to be great, but there is going to be a lot of banter. There's a lot of interaction with the crowd. There's a, yeah. it's, it's all improv, and that is why I think our shows are special. You know, I and, agree. Uh, it's, it, is, it is experience. It's, it's a show. It's not a concert. It's a show. It's a show. Yeah. 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 Do you yeah. think, because obviously you guys have had a great career, and you know you write these hilarious fucking, almost like, it's almost like a stand-up bit in a song sometimes. Like, yeah. do you think that has ever like held you guys back from getting to another level because people don't take you as seriously with those kind of songs? Yeah, I think what what happens most of the time is is that someone will just know you know the funny songs or whatever, and then mm-hmm. this happens all the time. Some someone will just randomly for whatever reason, whether it's a playlist or something, take a deep dive and go, "Oh man, you guys have substance to what you do." Right, because like, you do have serious songs. Yeah, and but even the funny songs, for the mm-hmm. most part, have some sort of a serious undertone to it. I mean, like, yeah. even, let's talk about I'm Gay, for example. I'm Gay is just literally about being happy. It's about, mm-hmm. like, let's stop worrying about this and worry about this and stop being mean to one another about this. And you don't have to be sad just because you like this kind of music. You know, just you can be a happy person and love shitty, sad music. That's fine. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that, that that's that, – and I don't mean shitty – I wasn't saying that sad music is shitty. I like sad no, music too. Yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just saying that like that like there's there's almost always some sort of a thing under there. I mean, like if you think about 1985, for example, again, that that cover song, you know, that we did. Yeah, um, yeah, like a good cover. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's pretty sad, actually. You know, it's oh it's yeah, kind of, me the fuck out, and as I've gotten it, older. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, I mean, it, it's such a happy, and I think that's the magic of of Bowling for Soup is sort of like taking some of these things like like for example high school never ends is a true statement and we shake Mm -hmm. our heads every day you know like in in the office or in life or in the line at the at the starbucks or whatever because everyone is just acting like it's fucking high school and you know and you're just like ah fuck but you know we managed to put that feeling into a song where you're like okay i'm gonna laugh about this 
but I still hate everyone I work with, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't necessarily, I think I, really what held us back was, is not, a, and I'm okay with this. I like where our career is. I think if we would have blown up more, we probably would, you, you know, again, the bigger you are, the harder you fall kind of thing. Like, I love that we're still selling out House of Blues size venues here. We're playing arenas in the UK. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very comfortable with how big we are um, as far as the band is concerned. But when 1985 was such a hit, almost was such a hit, uh, Ohio did okay. When we went, we went back with High School Never Ends, uh, the big backlash was is that it was just 1985-2. You know, they oh, were really? just like, oh, you know, mm. but like, I mean, and I'm arguing with the label going, like, no offense, I love Everclear, but he's written the same song seven times, and they've all been <laughs> right. hits, you know? And But, I mean, that's – that because that's what that dude does, and it's amazing, right? I mean, yeah. he doesn't look all those songs. And uh, and the label just wouldn't fight it. They just wouldn't fight, and then we went to a, a, a ballad next, and that was sort of like the, the, the darling days of radio – Mm -hmm. uh, and us being sort of like the one us and all American rejects kind of be in those bands that were and simple plan be in those pop punk bands that were getting played on on uh, pop radio you know our yeah. our time our time there but you came to an end there but you know it's uh it's not something that I I look back on and I'm 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 not angry or jaded about it or anything it just that's the way that it happened but you know I that yeah. song is you know it's funny because that song is our third most streamed song and I'm still in touch with all of the label people. And, uh, the main guy, I won't mention his name because I, I don't, I don't know what that he wants to be. I don't even know what he's doing these days, but, uh, he doesn't be on a podcast said, with millions of listeners. <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, he's, I just don't want people hitting him up. Uh, yeah. he, he's, he's still, he says that's his biggest regret. In his career, not was not following through with high school never ends because he it should have been a smash. But what are you gonna do? So, did with Jive Records, did your contract just like end and they didn't renew, or did they just get tired of boner jokes and they dropped you? <laughs> no, they <laughs> uh they cleaned house. They um, so oh. 2009, sorry for partying, had just come out. We were going to radio first of the year, uh, in 2010 with uh, No Ablo Ingles. We're gonna go for it, and um. It you know all signs were pointing at all the great things people were loving the video it was uh, it was it was going good uh, they that year sold to um, Sony I believe and when they did they just they basically went through and just all of the stuff that wasn't making them millions and millions and millions of dollars mm. they just dropped so even though we were a profitable band and and that was spoken to us it was like you know we're not losing money on you you know it's it's not um, but you're just you not know, Madonna. You're not right. Well, remember, we were so when we signed a jive, it was still an independent label, it was owned by a man named Clive Calder, and they had Britney Spears, NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, R. Kelly before he was R. Kelly, right? Um, you know, uh, this, um, another uh, girl, not uh, another girl band that was huge. I think they were called Secrets or some shit, they were huge, like doing arenas in the UK. I mean, they, they all of these bands were setting records as far as sales and, and concerts yeah. and all that shit. And then we're just sort of down here, you know, and then there's over here's Tribe Called Quest. And, you know, they're just like yeah. they're just, they're spitter spatter. We were just an experiment. We were literally just a band that um, because they owned Volcano. So they already had Tool. They had uh, and they owned the label that had Real Big Fish. But they okay. didn't put us on those labels. They left us on Jive. Again, as sort of an experiment, the experiment worked. Yeah. Um, we had hits, but but um, anyway, two thousand nine, they all of that stuff got dropped. So we just got dropped, sort of mid record. We didn't get the record back, uh, which you know sucks because we really thought "Sorry for Partying" was kind of our masterpiece. Um, it's that 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 album is six singles deep, man. I I still think that, but. Um, Anyway, I, you know, we had a meeting in, that night. We went in the hotel. We drank a bunch, and I was like, uh, um, you know, well, we could either crawl back home with our tail between our legs, or we can say, fuck it, finish this tour, yeah. 
go back in the studio, and that's what we did. We, we had an album out um, that summer called Fishing for Woos, and it's a fan favorite. And then uh, we've been on our own since then. So self, uh, we've been independent since 2009. So we've been independent much longer, you know, if you count the first six years and then these past 13, you know, 19, 19 of our uh, – well, that, none of that math makes sense. Anyway, we're yeah. almost 30, and we run jive for nine Math years. is hard, man. <laughs> Have you ever thought about Taylor Swifting it and just going back and recording a hangover you don't deserve? <laughs> Redo it? Oh, shit. We're doing that. Um, so yeah? our, first, yeah. our first greatest hits, all re-records. This is, this yeah. is a great I'm, – I'm glad you called it that because our first greatest hits, all re-records. But at the time, Taylor Swift hadn't done that yet. Yeah. And we're, we're really big in the U.K., so we have to be very careful with how we do things because they their culture will think that you, they don't want they don't want to feel like they're always being sold something else, you know, like oh, okay. so we didn't want it to seem like we were doing that for just to make more money. We didn't want it to seem like, hey, we're we're re-recording these songs so you'll buy this and mm -hmm. we'll get make more money from you. We were really trying to get have our have masters of those songs really for six yeah. and things like that. So um, and, and really it worked out fine because those, those songs, we really did make them better. It was, uh, the first 10 years. So, uh, mm. 94 to 2000, 2003. So it comes up through like the bitch song and, uh, and girl, the bad guys want and that stuff. And we really did make all those songs sounds, ama sound amazing. Taylor Swift goes back, starts re-recording her shit and educates the entire planet on what masters right. means and all that shit going. Our greatest hits two comes out in August, and now we're like, "Fuck it!" They're all called BFS version. And, yes, uh, so, exactly. Yeah. So now all the hits are coming out because this is uh, the next six years. So it's through uh, it's two thousand four through uh, two thousand nine, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's um, it's got as we said, nineteen eighty five, high school never ends, almost on there, all re records. Uh, very few changes. Uh, somebody actually took note recently uh, that we bumped 1985 up a couple of BPM. Gives oh, it a nice. little bit more energy. Um, didn't change it just to change it. It just kind of always felt slow to me. And, uh, you know, but other than that, you know, they, uh, they, sound, they sound great. That's a really great idea. And, yeah, you should maybe do like a Taylor Swift spoof in the cover or something. <laughs> Yeah, right. BFS version. Yeah. Um, yeah, because, I mean, so 1985 was, like, the, the biggest hit, right? And, like, yeah. the, you know, between Spleen, I'm sure Mitch had to get royalties on that song. Obviously, yeah. the record label took some of that. I mean, there couldn't have been much left over for you guys that are actually out there fucking playing it, right? Yeah, well, I mean, Mitch Mitch and John have 40%, and I have 20 And I'm only mm -hmm. saying that because you can look it up. Like, I mean, I, yeah. I'm not I'm not disclosing any crazy information, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a writer on the song, and uh, so... We we all did pretty well with that thing. I mean, I I, good. I I got to put some money back for college, and Mitch bought a car, and uh, you know he has a swimming pool, and uh, <laughs> he's, he, he's got uh, a pool. He's doing all right. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but yeah, I mean the the label de definitely took lots and lots of that. I mean, it, you yeah. know, not owning the masters is it really sucks because, um, especially after a certain amount of time, you know, like because because they're not out there working the songs, but if something were to happen with right. the song, they they would get paid for it. They reap the benefits. And, uh, and that's the thing is like we're out playing every night, you know, and still doing this. At, you know, as I said, in my fifties, and Chris is in his mid fifties, and you know, I'm taking time away from my children and my dogs and my wife to go out there. And and what are you doing when you play shows? You're promoting your music, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's what we're doing. It's and uh, you know, trying to keep people listening to us. But you know, again, I I I didn't walk away from that super jaded. I was I was I really wasn't upset that we were getting dropped from Jive Records. I was more upset that that record didn't get a chance because we worked really hard on it, and uh, you know, we 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 spent a month recording it, which is a long time for us. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I it, I just I really thought the songs were there, and I think sonically it was really really good and. Um, but you know, again, I, I understand business is business and that's, that's sort of what you get with me. You know, I, I'm not really, um, I, I, I'm not really hard to convince that something is, is a good business decision if it is, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, and I honestly, you know, it's been fun trying to figure out ways to, to make videos for, you know, out of our own pocket and, you know, and release our own records and, and to do all this shit, you know, and, and it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's, um, 
you know, it's still going really well. <laughs> you know, I mean, I thanks yeah. MGA, you know, I, I'm just like, you know, I <laughs> the mean, pop punk savior. I say it all the time, man. Yeah, but you know, everything goes in waves, and mm -hmm. uh, pop punk kind of comes up and and does this, and it's sort of like hair metal. It's it, I can I consider pop punk sort of like another hair metal or a or a 80s hip hop kind of thing where it just yeah, it's sort of grunge too, the like whole kind of wave. Yeah, totally. And uh, but then MGK comes out and starts makes a pop punk record with Travis Barker, and uh, and is doing arenas and, and you know almost stadium sized crowds and shit on that first record. And you know we're just like, okay, streams are up. This is great. You know yeah. people are you know, they're they're finding it. They're you know they, now ride that wave. People are still finding Bowling for Soup for the first time, you know, and people are coming to the shows and and uh, you know I can't I, I uh, I'm kind of bummed out that that some 41 are breaking up, but I yeah. I also understand, you know. I mean they're they're all at those guys have really 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 hit the road hard. Um, it just always seems weird when a band breaks up at that point because they've been together yeah. for what, like 36 years or something, <laughs> like 26 years, however well, long no, it was. Like they've been together 30, so I think they've been together. 28 or something like that yeah like, um, i don't think they've been qu together quite as long as we have it's just wild younger, when you're they're together they're that us. long to be like yeah. all right we're now we're done you know yeah i mean you know i mean i you know derek's derek's had a lot of health stuff and he's got a yeah. baby at home now and and uh you know i know cone is doing radio and he's got kids and uh everybody's got kids now in that band that's so, a big factor you know, yeah I haven't asked because it's none of my business and I feel like, you know, when they're, when they want to discuss what's happening, they'll discuss it. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I just sent, you know, when they made that announcement, I just sent everybody like a, Hey, good vibes, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you can only, only imagine that, that it's, that it's gotta be for personal reasons, you know, but, uh, yeah, yeah I, just, I mean it, it has to be bittersweet too. Like even though like you want you want it to be over, you really don't want it to be over at the same time. Yeah, so totally, yeah. And I I just they're just you know we toured with them for the first time in two thousand one, and they were you know only only uh, one of them was only old enough to drink, and uh, <laughs> they broke down and ended up in our van for a week. So it was just both bands, and uh, we had our two crew guy and one of their crew guys. And a van for a week and had a had a ball, you know, and uh, so we've yeah. been friends ever since. But I would say that they're probably my favorite pop punk band that isn't Bowling for Soup. I mean, I, nice. I, just, I love their band so much. You know, I just I, I just think they're great. Yeah, they're fantastic. I'm going to catch them in Cleveland. Hopefully I get to do an interview with one of the guys and maybe uh, oh, cool. get some uh, get some scoop on it. Yeah, I, I went last time I saw them in Cleveland. Actually, uh, I I made about one or two songs in before my buddy got choke slammed by someone in the crowd, and then somehow we got oh, kicked out. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Well, that's Cleveland for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's rough and rowdy around here. Yeah, it um, is. Other than the greatest hits volume two, are you guys planning anything else for the twenty year anniversary of a Hangover? So next year's thirty years, twenty years of Hangover, um, and. Uh, so big tour, uh, world tour. We'll be in the UK in February with Less Than Jake. We're uh, most likely going to Canada in March, uh, all summer in the US, then looking at Australia, and then um, some other stuff that I can't mention because uh, because of other things that are booked. Yeah. But, uh, a busy, busy year nonetheless. And then, and then I fill in the gaps doing country um, and uh, just staying super busy doing that. But... Um, you know, I'm excited about next year. I mean, that, this we have a fall tour coming up, and 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 all the shows are starting to sell out and stuff. So, it's oh, just sick. a really good time to be in a pop punk man. I I was just watching oh, yeah. Less Than Jake's tour, and they you know sold out most of their shows. And then I'm looking, I'm obviously watching my you know I love Story of the Year, and they're on tour with Yellow Card, and those shows are doing really well. And so uh, Simple Plan and Sum Forty One and Offspring are out, and Blink One Eight Two's out, and it, New Found Glory are always on tour. So, um, yeah. man, it just seems like we just got to get good Charlotte out of the fucking, out of the <laughs> locker room and get them on the field. Right. I yeah. I can't believe they haven't done that yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, know what they're waiting man. for. They're managing yeah. so many bands right now. Like they get that, they get that Madden oh, company, yeah. like, you know, working with all these like, upcoming out. Well, they also own AP magazine and all these different brands. Yeah. And, and uh, I think they actually just sold it though. I think they, they got they? off of that ship now. I heard. Okay. Well, and you know, Billy is like this insane comic book artist. Is he really? Like, oh, dude, that dude drew the cover for like the new 
one of these new Marvel things or whatever. It's like oh no shit. shit. Oh man, he's the man. Oh, I didn't know we that. Had him on, we had him on Rockstar Dad Show, and he was telling yeah. us about some of the stuff upcoming. And then uh, Rob, just my bass player, just showed me the other day uh, a new cover that he did, and it's like, wow, that's. I mean, it's real. It's crazy. Yeah, I knew he was like producing music and stuff. I didn't realize he was doing art yeah, and shit too. That's pretty cool. Sick, sick comic book artist, man. And then uh, Paul, Paul just graduated from from college. Actually, I think he just got his master's, if I'm not mistaken. Nice. Uh, up there and. Uh, and so he's, you know, he's doing his thing. You're just, everybody's busy. Everybody's just busy. You know. I know, man. Everyone's got so much going on. Yeah, totally, um, yeah. I did in the, in the while we're still on the topic of the Hangover album. There's uh, one one ask, question I want to ask about the girls. All the bad guys want music video. You personally had a few bands in that vid. Uh, went really hard on Aaron Lewis. <laughs> on yeah. That. Yeah. Did he have an issue with that? Did he ever reach out? So. Um, Fred Durst was mad at us. Oh, Fred um, Durst was, okay. Yeah. I think, honestly, I think I hurt Aaron Lewis's feelings. <laughs> um, and so we were doing Reading Festival later that year after that thing came out. And my ex-wife, what, we were parked next to them. And we're both very recognizable, right? You know, like my hair and, and you know, just the way that we dress and stuff back then. Yeah. You couldn't miss me. You could not miss that guy. So we both knew each other were there and, and you know, yeah. it was sort of tense. And uh, my wife, my ex-wife went up to him and said, hey, can my husband get a picture with you? And he just goes, <laughs> who's your husband? And uh, so I, um, we, we took a picture and he has his arm around me. I still have the photo. And uh, he says, so I guess this is us bearing the hatchet. And I go, Aaron, there's no hatchet. And he goes, I can understand Fred Durst and all that because he, he, he just, he just seriously looked at me and he just goes, why me? And I go, why you? <laughs> Cause you're the face of this genre of music, dude. Yeah. You're the one that everybody thinks about on MTV, those tattoos, your head, all of that. Like you're the guy. It's not mm -hmm. fr Fred Durst, maybe be the voice, but you're the face, man. You're what everybody thinks. It's it. Everybody knew exactly who I was spoofing the <laughs> second that camera shot or whatever. Oh yeah. And uh, so I was like, and it was just, it just, it made the most sense. So honestly, I think you should think of it as a tribute because that's, you know, and, and, uh, and he goes, okay, yeah, I can understand that. And we hugged. And then uh, later on, I was watching their set and uh, the power went out and they, they didn't have any, it, it, most of the mains were gone and it was a festival. They still had some speakers that were working. I really don't understand the the logistics of why this was yeah. the way it is. But he was able to play acoustic. And so he sat there and he's playing acoustic and he just looks over at me and just gives me this really nice little wink. And I and it was like I just gave myself the chills because I was like, Okay, we're good. You know, like yeah. everything's so we were good. But uh Apparently, some of the other people in the genre were a little mad at me. I guess the singer for Disturbed, <laughs> the singer for Disturbed hates me. You know who oh, loves man. the video? Slipknot. That Corey Taylor thought it was the funniest thing of all time because you know we have them come in and break a bottle over yeah. Fred Durst's head, and um, so yeah. But that, but again, apparently, and I'm sure Fred Durst doesn't even know who the hell we are anymore. But apparently, he was upset with us um, for a bit. But uh, yeah, Aaron Lewis and, and us are good. And, uh, you know, he, he actually lives around me. I don't ever see him, but people run into him all the time. And, uh, but you know, he's, he's doing country, but he's sort of on that political side of things. And I'm real, just, yeah. more, just more just red dirt and, <laughs> and, uh, but probably doesn't make a lot of sense for us to play shows together. Like you're both country technically. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Um, other than, uh, Fred Durst and, uh, David Draymond from Disturbed, have you guys ever, you feel like you ever went too far on a joke that like triggered anybody or any celebrity or anything like that? Um, well, I feel like we probably did. Um, I don't know that anybody's ever really been, been like super mad at us or anything. Yeah. Uh, most people are usually pretty, pretty nice to us and most people get it you know right. um it's satire it's, honestly yeah. it's funny we have a we have a song called award show taylor swift that's out there and uh it's just basically like about like how happy she is when she oh my god when she wins an award <laughs> and uh and the swifties love it they're like oh my yeah. god this is such a cute song you know and, and yeah. it's 
I, I feel like we're just sort of like that. You know, I was class clown when I was a kid. I was the I was the funny fat kid. And I could get away with so much because I didn't really ever insult the teacher. Like wh the the kind of funny I did was stuff to where it wasn't like I wasn't trying to get the class against them or insult them mm -hmm. or anything. It was really just be stupid. And most of the time they would laugh along with me. And when they had had enough, they would go, OK, Jarrett, that's enough. You know, and I feel like that's sort of the way I am in everything, you know, in this, in this business, you know, anybody that I've ever name checked or whatever, nobody, that doesn't seem like yeah. anybody really that upset with me, you know? Um, so, I mean, we all know you as like, you know, the funny pop punk guy and now you've got this yeah. like burgeoning, you know, solo like country thing you're doing. Like how long yeah. were you like, how long were you dabbling with the idea of doing it before you actually pulled the trigger on it? And then was it kind of difficult to get people to take the idea seriously because of everything you've done so far? Yeah, uh, so I've been thinking about doing a country record for a really long time. Um, and in fact, at one time, I even thought about doing something called Bowling for Soup Goes Country and us doing like a covers record. But, you know, I've done a lot of side projects over the years. Uh, Kelly Dolly Rot and I have a band called Jarrett and Kelly, and me and Linus of Hollywood have a band called Jarinus that's like a real, comp like, a, like a dirtier Still Panther. Um, and... Uh, you know, I've, I've done all these things. And, and so I, I was just like, I, I was like, man, I don't really want to do like another side thing. And I don't really want to do a novelty thing. Mm -hmm. So I really want to do it for real because I grew up listening to this music and it really does mean a lot to me. And it really is what I listen to. And, and to be yeah. honest, and, and a lot of people would probably be surprised to know that even Bowling for Soup songs are written on an acoustic guitar. And if I'm, and if you hear them before there's drums and guitar and me singing, you know, putting the little in, the, in, the, in my voice, if you hear it before that, it sounds like a country song. They all do. And then well, you're they, telling stories in your songs, too, in the, in the Bowling for Soup songs, which is a lot of country music is. So That is all it. And it, thank you. That's exactly mm -hmm. that. I, that's the biggest influence it had on me is like. You know, if you think about Kenny Rogers, The Gambler, like you could see that song in mm -hmm. your head. Like it, it's almost yeah. like a movie. And I, that's that's what I always wanted to do was tell stories. And, and I wanted my songs to be visual like that to where it's like you everybody who is a Bowling for Soup fan has a vision of who they think the girl of the bad guys one is. Right. Like yeah. it, maybe it's the girl in the video, but maybe it, but really Nona doesn't look like that. I describe her. That's not what she looks like, you know. And so um Anyway, I've always wanted to do it, and, and, and I just would talk about it all the time. Like, man, I want to make a country record. Man, I want to make a country record. And I'd, I'd, I'd meet people and be like, dude, we should make a country record. You know, and that, that's yeah. what musicians do, right? We're all Oh, yeah. Just, we need to jam, should... man. We should jam. Oh, yeah, let's do this thing. You know what we should do? Let's make a metal band. Let's do a hardcore punk yeah. band. You know, yeah. I think I've started three bands with Frank Turner, and you know what I mean? Like, it's, <laughs> just, it, it's like it, it's always something. And, um, but anyway, pandemic hits. And, um, I, uh, you know, we, we, the first year I did a bunch of online shows and then we took a bus to the Poconos and made a Bowling for Soup record, Pop Drunk Snot Bread out now and, um, had a blast, got that thing going. And then second year of the pandemic isolation thing starts and my buddy, Zach Malloy, um, who was living in Nashville just goes, dude, this is the time we don't have anything to do. Mm -hmm. You got nothing on your calendar. Let's just do this. And so we did it and uh, wrote and he produced that record. We wrote it over text message. So just text messages back and forth. With no like shit. Guitar. And I was dragging all of that into uh, a Google Doc and then and and literally putting the songs together like they're puzzle pieces. Like here's this lyric and then this and this and this. It goes like this. And then we just had songs. And um, so the big thing was is whether or not Texas country would uh, – and, and we should explain that really to your audience is going to be a little bit more vast than just – they might not understand that I'm not like Luke Bryan country. Right. I'm like I'm, – I'm what's called Texas country, red dirt country. So it's more a little old school, more like – more Willie Nelson than, you know, than um, whatever. Um, so not, not as much Jason Aldean. <laughs> there's not as much Jason Aldean in yeah. the uh, thing. And, uh, but I do agree with Miranda Lambert. But uh, yeah. anyway, so <laughs> I, uh, 
I, you know, I did it, and uh, man, it's been great. I'm actually nominated for Emerging Artist of the Year for the Texas Country Music oh, Awards damn. this year. Um, I, uh, you know, I just I just got a new agent. We're uh, we're as busy as we can be. Rob from Bowling for Soup is my bass player in the country band. So, oh, sick. Uh, you know, I we're staying busy, and it's good. I've got three top thirty hits here in Texas, and um, you know, it's going great. I'm having a fun t- yeah. fun time doing it. I like was surprised at how good it was. And I don't mean it's not like a dick, but, but like it is, it is so good. And like, I'm not like a huge country fan. I like, I like country music, but like, again, it's like, you're the funny bowling for soup guy. That's what the music I've known you for. And I, I knew, yeah. see, the thing is, I knew you know how to write a good song. I know for a fact you have creative storytelling ability and you know how to write catchy ass yeah. music. No one can doubt that you know how to write hooks. But again, it's country. It's a whole other thing. I didn't know what to expect. And I was like, I was so surprised. Like, wow, this is so fucking good. Like, not just like, oh, this is good for Jarrett. Like, no, this is right. actually a good song. Like, Yeah, it's yeah. been very well received. And even, you know, it's been really cool because even the other artists have, honestly, what I get really from the artists is, is like somebody be like, oh, Jarrett from Bowling for Soup made a country record. And they'd be like, really? Oh, well, that makes sense. You know, I mean, that's really what has been sort of like yeah. my reception uh, here. But everybody's been amazing and great and promoters and artists and radio and um it's been cool and you know the other thing is is that i think my i think bowling for soup fans needed me to say like look you don't have to like this like i'm i'm not i'm this is something else like i i love that you like bowling for soup but it's it it doesn't it doesn't offend me if you guys don't like country music if you don't like this and so but what i've heard more than anything is like i fucking hate country and now I like this. Yeah. So do I like country now? <laughs> like you know, you're you're like, the gateway drug for country, man. I guess for so. pop punk kids. I guess so. All these pop punk kids are like, okay, now I'm listening to this and this, and we're actually taking a. Uh, there's a band called the Vandaliers from here in Texas, and they've done like the Flogging Molly cruise. They they did the last Flogging Molly tour, but they're like a punk rock country, and we're taking them to the UK. It's just like we're oh, gonna, nice. we're taking you and. Uh, Cause it's like people need to hear it. And, uh, so, but yeah, man, it's, it's been really good. It really has. I love it. I love hearing that, like getting to see a different side of you, you know, your story again, like your storytelling is on a whole nother level. And I think that's why like the pop punk kids like, Oh shit, I actually do like country because like, if you like that kind of music, you're going to like it with some twang maybe, you know? And yeah. I love hearing that side of it. And then I love your, your rock star dad podcast. Again, it's yes, another, well, dude, you, gotta, you gotta come on it. Oh, I, I would love I, to. I, I'm a dad. Yeah. I, I kind of rock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you gotta do it. Yeah, I actually was just thinking about when you started talking about your kid earlier. I was just like, shit, we gotta get you on. Well, Gary's on vacation right now. We're about to do, uh, about to send out a uh, calendar with new dates. So I will send it to you. You gotta come on. Yeah, I would right. love to. I loved, I love the clips you've been posting, man. Because again, it's a whole other side of like, like you, you posted that clip the other day about like, you know, you can't when you can't sleep. And then, like, you wake up, you feel like shit, and then you eat like shit because you didn't sleep the night before. I'm like, God damn, I relate to that so yeah. hard. <laughs> like, I know, man. It's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, the Rockstar Dad Show has been super cool. When we started out, we were like, okay, we're not going to talk about music. We're only going to talk about dad stuff. And it's like, yeah. you kind of run out of that. And then you, we found ourselves asking all the dads, you know, we get rock stars, comedians, actors, but we, we'll have our neighbors on. And we, we found ourselves yeah. sort of in a rut, like, asking the same questions. So, it's kind of it kind of goes off the rails sometimes, but we try to bring it back to how being a dad is affected or how it affects uh, life. You know, when they're on the road or you know, and like what yeah. coming home is like, and a lot of things that these guys don't get to talk about. You know, that they people always ask them about throwing TVs out the window or what their favorite <laughs> song is or how they got the name of their band. You know, nobody is going like, dude, how are the kids doing? What did you guys do during the pandemic? Right. What's your favorite thing to do as a family? You know, and uh, so we're 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 having a lot of fun doing that. I love it, and yeah, we can obviously when I when I come on, we can dive into it more. But yeah, even on my end as like a you know a content creator, radio show host, whatever, like balancing that weird lifestyle with you know trying to you know raise another person to be a, yeah. a good person. You know, I can't imagine yeah. like the added pressure of like traveling and you know you know, touring and like having to be here and there. And like, you know, it's, that's gotta be a whole nother like level to that. It's, we'll talk about it. Um, yeah. you know, and, uh, when you're on my show and then yeah. that'll yeah. give us some content, but I, I'll tell you, I, uh, it's so funny because you talk about that, but my studio, the studio that I'm in right now is actually called mm-hmm. the daycare because at oh, any yeah. moment, it doesn't fucking matter who's here. 
Like, yeah. like famous people come in and out of the door all the time. And my kids, yeah. it's just nothing. Like they don't give a shit, right? <laughs> they don't give a fuck. They will just open this door like right in the middle. Of, even when I say like, dude, he's singing right now or I'm singing right now I'm, or I'm doing Chucky or whatever it is I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. They don't give two shits. If they need something, they're opening that door. It does not matter what I do. And so my studio is actually called the daycare. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, um, my, uh, my daughter and oldest son are 20 and 17, so... Uh, not luckily, but but they're I don't see you know they're gone all the time. Yeah. Uh, but my my ten year old um, is uh, in constant need of something, and uh, yeah. so um, I am uh, I am the I am the person that he goes to because I'm the easiest to access. I'm right here. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, he's like he's in the next room. I'm coming to bother him. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I'll I'll be recording like a spot for uh, Sirius XM, and like my kid, like well. He'll like knock on the door and like open it. And I'll be like, I'll be literally in the middle of recording. I'm like, I have my finger up, like, hold on, hold on. Yeah. And he's like, sneaks in and he starts trying to talk to me, but like in a whisper, he's like, can I? I'm like, just give me one second. <laughs> like, yeah, so true. Yeah. Um, just, I mean, Dad, are you on the phone? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yesterday I did. Well, I was. Six hours of, <laughs> I did six hours of country interviews yesterday. Oh, damn. And, uh, he came in three times and just like, are you on the, yes, I still, it says it. I told still. you, you know, <laughs> okay. um, I, well, I know we gotta get things wrapped up here. Uh, I do. I have a couple like, like just fast round questions. If you're down, okay. just have a few cool, things. Man. Yeah. All right. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Yes. <laughs> Is cheesecake pie or cake? Fuck. Um, <laughs> Here's the thing. I hate pie, but I like cheesecake, so I'm going cake. Okay, fair enough. Uh, do you have like a comfort show or movie that you put on when you need to turn your brain off, like something you've just seen a million times? Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Damn. That, yeah, that, I that would. Uh... I've I've watched it every day for five years. What? And, uh, yeah, I watched it every <laughs> single day for five years. I have it memorized so much that I know what's going on in the background of like all of the stuff man it's it's I, I mean it's just you know i was i was me and me and eric um our original bass player were homeless for two years and that's what we did we would just uh we, wherever we were staying we would just you know get a get a 12 pack of beer put on yeah. put that on and uh it felt it didn't feel like we were not in a home, feel homeless. yeah <laughs> I saw the movie for the first time when I was like seven. My dad used to like watch movies. He's like, well, if you're going to sit here, you can play with the toys or watch this movie. And he put on Pulp Fiction. I was like, I don't know what the hell is going on in this movie. And then I got older. I'm like, oh, this is a good movie. <laughs> it's just, oh, man, I just shot Marvin in the face. And you're just like, what? And he's just I like, remember being very confused by it. Brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, if someone wants to listen to Bowling Pursuit for the very first time, what's like the best starter song? Like, what's the track, the good entry gateway point for the band? Um, almost. Almost. Good, good. And uh, last one here. What is the ultimate pop punk song? The one that just defines the genre. It could be a Bowling for Soup song. No, I don't think it is, man. I think honestly, I, <laughs> nah. I, I you know, I I would go Girl the Bad Guys one if I was to pick a Bowling for Soup song. Yeah. But I think, um. Shit. Okay, it's a toss up. I either think it's Swing Swing by the All American Rejects nice. or it's Fat Lip by Sum Forty One. I had a feeling Sum Forty One was gonna be an option there. Yeah. <laughs> I just oh, man, that man. fucking half hour of power, that that EP is so good. So good. It it yeah. just you can't believe that seventeen year old kids made that up. Like you're oh, just dude. yeah. It's bonkers to me that like they're just these little kids that listen to iron maiden and they they wrote that like it yeah it's just so fucking good dude yeah it it's so good yeah because i read that like, he wrote that riff that fat lip riff like he was waiting for i think dave to come pick him up or something like that and he just yeah. like fucking bah, 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 and like and wrote it as like five minutes before he left the house like it's just it's so i mean i'm sure that's happened to you before where you've written a riff or come with a lyric like just on the yeah. fly it's like Oh, that becomes something that millions of people listen to yeah. and love. Like, Absolutely, yeah. It's it's that's a definite thing. It's you know that's, yeah. I say it all the time. Like, <clears throat> it's so crazy to be sitting at the kitchen table in my underwear, just messing around with a guitar, and like I, I just wrote the bitch song. You know, like it's yeah, it's yeah, crazy. You know, so, uh, but yeah, man, 
it's uh, it's good stuff. Well, Jared, it's been so solid talking. Honestly, there's about like two hours more worth of shit I want to talk to you about. I had like a whole list of questions I didn't even get to. So we're definitely going to do this again. And uh, yeah, I would love to come on your show. We'll, we'll touch base on that as well. But um, is there any socials you want to plug before we get out of here? Absolutely. The all new bowlingforsoup.com is so awesome. Um, spent a lot of time and effort getting that thing together. I'm blogging again. So nice. uh, you can go and read my thoughts on things, which is. Uh, sometimes dangerous um and uh jarrett ray reddit.com if you're interested in the country thing you know even if you're not you know just go give it a spin also follow me on tiktok uh instagram all that good stuff hell yeah all right thanks so much man you have a great rest of your day and uh all the millions and millions of jess lee fans out there thanks for listening and hanging out we'll be back soon